Thanks for listening to The Rebuild, a Seattle Seahawks podcast with me, Rob Staten. The DK Metcalf situation is an interesting one. Firstly, let's just address what might be the most important point. I don't get any sense that Metcalf wants to leave Seattle. You can just tell sometimes when a player's head has been turned. Metcalf almost feels like the opposite of this. He's making light of Chiefs fans calling for him to head to Missouri on Twitter. He's on a podcast talking about a new leadership role in Seattle. He's vouching for Drew Locke. He's spoken in the past about enjoying life with the Seahawks in this city. And rather than view Russell Wilson's departure as a motivating factor to get out of Dodge, he seems content. Let's not forget this was the man gesturing to Geno Smith during the Washington game on Monday Night Football last season, implying that he should be starting, not a clearly injured and impacted Wilson. Then on the other side, we have Pete Carroll making it clear he's desperate to keep Metcalf. So all signs point to an extension. And in any other year, I think it would be a formality. Except maybe this year. The trades and subsequent contract extensions involving Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams, along with the business concluded in free agency, has created an unusual clarity. We know what the market value is for a top receiver in terms of salary and trade compensation. There's no mystery. But the numbers on the contracts are so high, you're ultimately left with a choice. Pay what you have to or move on. The Seahawks and Metcalf could probably get a deal done right now for 20 to $22 million. But do the Seahawks want to commit to that? Metcalf, I think, absolutely would. I think it's simply down to whether the team wants to make that investment. After all, they've just spent the last two weeks talking about a newfound opportunity in terms of resources, including cap space. Paying one player, a non-quarterback, $22 million a year to play receiver immediately puts a hefty contract back on the books. And let's not forget one other thing. The Seahawks from 2010 onwards found value at receiver in a variety of places, in free agency with Sidney Rice, in round two with Golden Tate, and in undrafted free agency with Doug Baldwin and Jermaine Curse, and I guess Ricardo Lockett as well. Do they want to try and do that again and add even more picks to their existing treasure trove by trading Metcalf? That's all well and good, though, but there are strong counters too. Pete Carroll has long sought big, tall, fast number one receivers. Metcalf is his dream to an extent, the player that he often talked about wanting to bring to Seattle. Carroll also loves explosive plays. Metcalf delivers there in a significant way. He also gives any quarterback playing for Seattle this year, next year, or in the future a fantastic weapon just as it would be a disaster asking a young quarterback to throw behind a bad offensive line, asking them to throw to bad receivers or inexperienced receivers is also a problem. Carroll insists they aren't rebuilding. He said it a few times now. Trading away Metcalf after dealing Wilson and cutting Bobby Wagner would make him look like he was insulting our intelligence in the most extreme of ways. And we can all see that the Seahawks are rebuilding, and we all can see why Carroll insists they aren't. But his actions and his words would be so contradictory if he traded Metcalf here. I'm not sure that he could do it for that reason alone. You can return all of this back over the net as well, though. Metcalf had long stretches last season in games where he just wasn't targeted. He was ignored. What if that happens again in the next couple of years? It's bad enough when he costs between 2 and $4 million and isn't getting the ball. Imagine that happening when he's on $22 million. It's also an outstanding draft at receiver. Someone I really trust who knows a lot more than I do and a pro. Told me recently there might be 30 receivers in this draft who could make an early impact in the league. Personally, I think players like Kevin Austin Jr., for example, could be league-leading talents in the right situation. You've got the elite big names like the duo at Ohio State or Alabama's Jamison Williams. 
to the appealing Christian Watson, Alex Pierce, Wandale Robinson, Calvin Austin, Jaylet Tolbert, right through to Isaiah Weston, Bo Melton and Kyle Phillips, and many, many more. You might be able to add two players between rounds three and five, get something out of them for a fraction of the cost while adding extra picks and saving money. And I think we're heading into a period now where some teams are going to start playing money ball at receiver. And yet there's also an enormous risk taking a 24-year-old insane talent, homegrown, in Carol's words, one of the best picks they've maybe ever had in Seattle, who appears to be settled and happy, a building block, and getting rid of him because the market has put you under some pressure. It's not a good look to other players either. Come to Seattle, and if the market increases, we won't pay you, or we'll get rid of our best players merrily. Does anybody really want to be part of that? Is that an attractive sales pitch to prospective free agents? Come and play for us. But you know that really good player who plays across from you? If the market dictates, we'll get rid of him and we'll just draft a replacement. It's not exactly the Rams philosophy, is it? So the Seahawks have to make the call. Do they want to pay a receiver $22 million a year? If not, trade him. Call the Jets. Try to get 35, 38, and another pick in the 60s. Use the draft to your advantage to replace him and build up your roster. Otherwise, end this conversation now. The last thing this team needs is another saga. Get the deal done now before anybody else, Debo Samuel, for example, jumps the line and increases this market even more and makes it even harder to get a deal done. My prediction is he will sign a new contract and be a key figure of this rebuild, but we'll see. I think the NFL, after a furious start to the new league year, is going to experience a bit of a slowing of the drama until nearer the draft now as teams kind of take stock. But I think eventually Metcalf will sign a new contract. But I'm fascinated to see how this plays out. I want to finish this podcast by touching on the cornerback position in the draft. Yesterday, I referenced Coach Jim Levin. And please check out that interview that I published yesterday. And his assertion that cornerback is vital in the 3-4, because if you want to play your front seven in the box, defending the run, attacking the quarterback, you've got to cover at the back end. He talked about the stress that it places on cornerbacks and the importance of the safeties too. And Seattle has invested big money at safety. I now wonder if they're going to go after that elite cover corner. You hear different things, though. I watched a video today where Bill Cower spoke of the importance of the nose tackle in the 3-4. We also know the Seahawks need another pass rusher, a really good one at that. I don't see them adding a nose tackle in this draft in the top 10, such as Jordan Davis. A two down, two gap, but doesn't feel like a good use of resources at the start of a major rebuild, even if Davis is a really, really good, exciting player. I think Al Woods will get that job with Brian Monet as a backup, and they've paid quite a lot of money for Woods. The other two positions, though, feel critical if this defense is going to work. Pass rusher and cornerback. I was reading an article in The Athletic this week talking about the key remaining needs for every team in the league. And it was quite distressing to read. I'm pretty sure, and I'm just, beside, I'm just citing this off memory, that it said Jacksonville pass rush, Detroit pass rush, Houston pass rush, Jets pass rush, Giants pass rush, Falcons pass rush. All of these teams picking ahead of Seattle. That's six teams. And there are four pass rushers. Aidan Hutchinson, Trevon Walker, Kayvon Thibodeau, Jermaine Johnson. Now, all of those six teams might not take pass rushers just because the Athletics says that that's their biggest remaining need. There's always a chance that they'll sign somebody in free agency or decide to wait on the position for whatever reason. Maybe they just prefer one of the offensive linemen or Source Gardner, for example. But Increasingly, it is difficult to project a situation where any of these guys falls to number nine, unless Kayvon Thibodeau is just considered so much of a, a problem with his character that he falls to number nine. And I just cannot see that happening. I don't think there's a, a great deal to that. And I think he'll go off the board in the top four. So if the top pass rushes are gone, what do the Seahawks do? 
I don't think there's any reason to force this and just make the right call. And I'm going to try and explain what today I think the right call might be. And I think maybe the Seahawks get it. They spent quite a bit more on their pass rush hedge, Lieutenant and Wusu, and a lot less on their cornerback hedge, Artie Burns. It's possible they're already anticipating the pass rushes will be gone and that number nine could present great value at cornerback instead. And maybe their decision in free agency further plays to that because paying DJ Reed $11 million a year has to be compared to paying Derek Stingley or Source Gardner $5.2 million a year, which is what Patrick Satan got as the number nine overall pick last year. And as a coincidence, he's also a cornerback. That's more than twice as much to pay DJ Reed rather than spending number nine on a cornerback. It was revealed today that Source Gardner is going to take an official visit to Seattle. I would imagine that Stingley's going to do the same. Is this trending in one way? The Seahawks under Carroll might not have been keen in the past on adding a cornerback early in the draft, but players like the pair I've just mentioned haven't been available to them. This could be a rare chance to draft a game-changing stud. And that's what they need at number nine, a top player at a premium position. The two players in question, everybody kind of knows about Source Gardner by now. He carries himself like a king. His personality is assured, if not cocky, but in a good way. He ran a 4-4 at the combine. He has great length. He looks like a Seahawks cornerback. Some people have suggested he might be the best player in the draft. Stingley, a couple of years ago, could have been the best cornerback in the country, even when he was playing at LSU as a, as a youngster. That's how good he was. And if people doubt that, type his name into YouTube with Jamar Chase and watch their practice tape together where he covers Jamar Chase. You will be stunned how good he is in coverage. But it shouldn't be a surprise when you look at his physical profile. He didn't work out at the Combine. There's a pro day for LSU. I think it's April 6th, certainly in the first week of April. But at Spark, at the same weight that he is now, and that he weighed in at the Combine, Stingley ran a 4.3040. And he jumped a 42-inch vertical. He is a special athlete. Now, he's got short arms. He's reasonably tall. He's big, but with, without length. But he just had special special qualities on tape and people are questioning him now because the last two years haven't been as good he's had some injuries but nothing too serious it's not like he's had an acl or an achilles or a bad ankle injury or a shoulder injury it's like a foot injury a list frank injury stuff like that nothing that really scares you away and let's also remember what's happened to lsu in the last two years they've completely collapsed they went from national champions to laughing stock Ed Orgeron, the coach, made himself an embarrassment and spent a bit too much time with his eye off the ball, I think it's fair to say. It wasn't really conducive with any of the players at LSU shining, and I think Stingley's maybe got caught up in that. But you bring him in in day one, and remember what people were saying about him in 2019, Let's just say three years ago, nobody thought there'd be any chance that that guy would ever end up in Seattle. He was going to be a top three pick nailed on. And if you were to get him at number nine, it might be a steal on the similar level to Micah Parsons a year ago, who fell to, I think he was a number 11 with the Dallas Cowboys. I think that's right, or 12 in that kind of range because of off-field concerns. And he already looks like one of the best defenders in the NFL. You may get a similar situation with Stingley if he's there at nine. And I think he's more likely to be there than Source Gardner because Gardner is well-regarded. And he could go number three to Houston easily. So he might not be there at number nine. Stingley, though, consensus kind of feels like he will be there. But we'll see. If the best pass rushes are gone, the Seahawks might not look a gift horse in the mouth here. They need to nail this pick, not overthink it. John Schneider bristled during a 7-10 Seattle sports interview yesterday, telling Bob Stelton he didn't like the assertion that 
supposedly Stelton had made, that they've been cute in recent drafts. I think it was a fair accusation that warrants some deeper cross-examination with Snyder. And John, if you ever want to do it, let's go. It'd be fun. Seriously, though, I think Stingley or Gardner will present the best chance Seattle has to get a great player, along with perhaps Devontae Wyatt or, yes, indeed, Jordan Davis. Not being cute probably means taking a cornerback at number nine, even if they haven't done it in the past. Then targeting a pass rusher such as Sam Williams with one of your next two picks. However, if Jermaine Johnson, Kayvon Thibodeau are there at number nine, we have a very different conversation. But the Seahawks have got options, good options. But just because the edge rushes aren't there, potentially, doesn't mean they shouldn't still be thinking defense and getting what could be an elite shutdown corner at number nine. Thank you for listening and have a great start to your weekend. For more, subscribe to the Rebuild podcast, now available on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Until next time, bye for now.